This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? Well, with Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate. Then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage that you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. My dog is literally barking at the door right now. One second. Roommate, one second. Come on. Hi, Rumi. Rumi, this is Carvel. She Rumi, says hi. Rumi's not interested in podcasts. Um, <laughs> hey, how to listeners. Today we have a very special guest host, Zach Rosen from Best Advice Show and Mom and Dad are Fighting. And Zach is here to do a special episode that is like uh, near and dear to his heart. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? what we're doing today yeah we are talking about how to approach the end of our pets lives oh wow as a person who lost you know we lost our family dog angeliki mm. rest in peace angeliki. Um, i mean i remember telling my then wife like what's the point you get a dog you love them they're perfect and then one day they just disappear and die on you she's <laughs> all this grief and she said well the you know, the 12 years is the point. <laughs> That's right. That's and, right. Uh, okay. So you got 12 years with Angeliki. We got 12 years with Angeliki and they were lovely. And um, it was just a really beautiful but painful transition. And it happened to match with my kids growing up. And I don't know. It's just, it's really powerful stuff. Yeah. I don't know if, if you do journalism to to help you process your stuff, but I, I think I do sometimes. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to kind of get ahead of this. I know I can't beat it. I know I'm going to have to face... My dog's death, you know, when the time comes, hopefully not for a couple of years or more, but like, mm. I just want to like be emotionally ready to like work through it and process it and like, you know, logistically ready too. I just kind of want to be prepared if that's even possible. Right. It's definitely a heavy topic, but it's a beautiful one. And I know so many people relate to it. I'm really excited for this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me do the show for this week. It's a big yes. honor. Yes. Yes. This is my first memory. It's the winter of 1989. I'm five years old. We live outside Detroit. My dad and I just got home from ice skating on the pond in my friend's backyard. We walk into the house and our dog, a 12 year old yellow lab named Nell, is lying on the kitchen floor. She was diagnosed with cancer earlier that year, but she's been able to get around the house and she didn't appear to be in too much pain when we find her in the kitchen, though, she's not okay. Her legs have given out, and she can't get back up. My dad lifts her and carries her through the laundry room into our garage, where his car is parked. He gently places her in the back seat. He tells me, it's time. And I know what he means. My mom's not home. She must be out with my sister somewhere. So my dad and I get in the car, and we drive the 10 minutes to our vet. I stay in the waiting room while my dad takes Nell back into the vet's office. The waiting room smells like dog treats and fur. The lighting is fluorescent. The floor is linoleum. I'm alone there. Eventually, an older man, probably my dad's age, appears before me. In my memory of him, he looks like the dad from the 80s movie Teen Wolf. I'm not sure who he is, but somehow he knows why I'm there. Maybe he works here? He says to me, comfortingly, it's really hard to say goodbye to your pet, huh? Yes, it really, truly is. I was a dog brother then. Now, I'm a dog dad. So I think because dogs have short lifespans, when they're aging, the aging process is just a lot quicker. It's at just a faster rate than humans. That's my wife, Shira. We're on our way to the vet to take our dog, Rumi, for a checkup. 
Yeah, I mean, she's eight. We learned recently that Rottweilers, she's 50% Rottweiler. No, she's nine. She's nine. She's nine? Yeah. Oh my God, she's nine. And we learned recently that Rottweilers have an average lifespan of eight to 12. So she's in her, t are you in your twilight years, sweetie? Shira and I adopted Rumi from a rescue organization nine years ago. We gave her the name Rumi because we love the Persian mystic poet Rumi, R-U-M-I. And yes, Rumi is also our roommate, so it kind of works both ways. I know everyone thinks their dog is cuter and better than all the other dogs, but in our case, it's actually true. We have two human children now as well, but I still call Rumi our firstborn. She's a gorgeous, brownish-orange, 90-pound beauty. Half Rottweiler, quarter bulldog, quarter hound. At least according to the DNA test. And she's strong. She pulls the leash harder than she should on our walks. She's still a good girl, though. She likes naps, kibbles, and spooning. She sleeps with us every night. She has for her whole life. And she's actually sleeping behind me right now on my office rug. Rooms, come here, lovey. We've had friends and friends' kids come over and say they're afraid of dogs, especially big dogs like Rumi. After a few hours, though, Rumi has won them over. This has happened countless times. Today she appears to be in pretty good health for a nine-year-old, but when she readjusts in bed, her groans have become more prominent. She also has this little growth above her right eyelid that we're concerned about. And she throws up, like, once a week. That's what brings us to the vet. Hi, how's it going? Good. Yes. Yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and get her checked in. Where's the Usually on how to, there's a listener asking a burning question they've been wrestling with. Well, today, I'm the listener with the burning question. What can and should I be doing to prepare for the final phase of my dog's life? I'm going to talk to two animal lovers who have thought a lot about the end. One's a pet owner whose love for her dog is inspirational. And the other is an end-of-life veterinarian with so much to teach us. Not only will they help us navigate one of the saddest moments of our lives, but by thinking through this question before something dramatic happens, there's something beautiful to be gained. Stay with us. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverage you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned, doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned how to snowboard, also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. And so, like, if this was a movie and we'd be seeing the montage of you and Bobby having this life together for so many years, can you describe some of those scenes? Oh, my gosh, absolutely. Scene one, him eating my underwear and my bra and <laughs> shoes and me like, oh, my gosh. Scene two, my dad saying he hates him and, <laughs> and doesn't even want anything to do with him. That's Gabby Santos. She was 17 when she became mom to Bobby, an excitable miniature pincher puppy. 
and that was like 2004 or something like that. So this okay. wasn't when it was cool to have dogs, right? This wasn't like when everyone's like, oh, let's take your dog inside of like um, grocery stores. And no, that was like right. still a taboo, not a thing. But your girl was uh -huh. doing that. How much does he weigh? At that time, he would weigh maybe like maybe five pounds. So he was kind of oh. like a small Yorkie when he was younger. Oh. And then, OK, we're going through the scenes now. We head out to outside. Oh, my gosh. Outside was our thing. Throwing the Frisbee, he would terrorize all of the plastic balls. So that was another seam. You would see us running, frolicking. We'll say frolicking Slow in motion. the beach. Yeah, absolutely. And then in his older age for our montage, that, that would go into like a lot of cuddle sessions and just him being on top of me and like us just like watching TV. And when did you start noticing a decline? I would say when he got to be like 16. And then right after he turned 17, Bobby had a seizure when Gabby was away from home. Right when I heard I flew, I, flew, I don't know if I, I ran red lights. I did nothing. Traffic was traffic signals weren't a thing for me. But she was hopeful, even if the people around her maybe weren't. They thought I was paying medical bills, like an emergency bill and all this and keeping him for no reason. And I was like, there is a reason. Mm. You know, he hasn't given me the signs and I wasn't being selfish. And then I got there and I got close to his little face. He just did mm -hmm. one smell because I saw his little nose and mm -hmm. I got licks on my face because I had tears and oh. he, I just got licks oh. on my face. And I was like, that's it. A few days later, Bobby was eating and drinking again from his hospital room. I slept in the, the parking lot for like three days. Well, they wouldn't let you wait in the waiting room? They would let me wait in the waiting room, but they wouldn't let me be with him. I was just in my car and I was like, that's where I ate, that's where I slept. Really? I went in there to go to the user restroom and come back out. So every like two hours, I would go out to see him and come back and go out to see him and come back. After that, Bobby started walking again. And so Gabby took him home and he was fine. Then seven months after the seizure, he got into some chocolate. Yeah, I was like, what are you doing trying to get into some chocolate? And um, he got into, a, it was a substantial amount. I had to rush him to the hospital again. And I was like, bro, what, what are you doing, sir? You're being real reckless. But he got his stomach pumped and again, seemed fine. He had his 18th birthday. I had my 35th birthday. And I think maybe by mid-August, we were sleeping and he had a light seizure. It was only about a minute or so, but I knew that some of them would come. And then I kind of just looked at his little face and I was like, oh, he's tired. I can see it. He's really just like, he's, the, he's almost there. Mm. It's this point in Bobby's story that got me really interested in hearing from Gabby. She recently went through this painful transition with clear eyes and a full heart. She had to determine, like so many of us will, when to fight for extra time and when to accept the signs that time is almost up. And then at that point, that's when I needed to grapple with those decisions and really feel like, what do I, what do I, where do I go from here? How do I, how do I do this that I don't make him suffer? Can I, do I have the strength to make that decision? Who can do this? Like, can I get this at my house? Do I have to go to my vet? This being euthanasia. How many euthanasia cases do you do a month? I have a team of two other doctors that work with me, and we probably see 90 to 100 a month between the three of us. Wow. Yeah, I'm full-time there, both part-time. This is Dr. Ellen Laframboise. She drives all over Southeast Michigan to provide in-home, end-of-life care for dogs and cats. I'm a certified hospice and palliative care veterinarian. I'm the owner of Crossroads Veterinary Hospice. Pet mom? Pet mom, for sure, yep. <laughs> Can you tell me about the most recent one you did? Yesterday, I was out to see three different families for euthanasia. That's pretty typical for me that I do about three visits a day. One of them yesterday was a five-year-old golden retriever who had cancer and it had started to progress and the family didn't want to let it get any worse. So they started to no notice the signs of decline and they reached out to us. So it was 
you know, it was incredibly sweet. We were in the backyard. Their other golden was there with them. Mm. Um, you know, the dog snuggled up on the, the bench and, uh, you know, on the family's lap. Um, and we helped him to, to fall asleep and then to, to pass. Um, so it's, it's emotional. As we approach the end of our pet's lives, Dr. Allen says we should think about how much we're asking of them. It's checking in constantly and, and recognizing that we're all going to have that instinct to want to hold on to them for as long as we can and to keep going. But when we step back and we look at it from our pet's perspective, you know, is this the right thing for them? Do we need to ask them to keep going in the way that things are today? Or is it time to, to allow them to rest? And so it's less so checking in with our pets and more so checking in with our relationship to them? Or? I, I think it's a, I think it's, it's both, right? Yeah. Because, you know, I, I always say our, our pets have a say in this process. I've had patients that are incredible patients. They'll take a pill no matter what. They just keep trucking along without being upset by the process. And I have other patients where it's a fight to get them to take any medications or it's a struggle to get outside to do just the basics. And it's okay for us to step back and look at that and, you know, again, assess, is this the right thing for them? You know, it's it's not about quantity anymore. It's about quality. We need to constantly assess that. We have our um, clients sometimes do that on a daily basis. How was today? You know, was it a good day? Was it a bad day? Or was it just kind of a meh kind of day? And, and keep track of that even because, what we find over time is that we kind of adjust to a new normal of how things are with our pet, right? And it's hard to look back and see how far we've come in the process. So we you know, might have a pet that was very active and fully mobile and then struggle to do certain things and then now needs help to get off the floor or, or has to be carried in and out, right? And so that's the new normal. But we've got to think about, you know, where were we? Where are we? And is this the right, right thing to keep doing to ask this of them? As I listened to Dr. Ellen, I thought about the grace with which Gabby navigated Bobby's aging. She seemed keenly aware of not wanting to ask too much of him, not wanting to keep him alive for her sake. And this is painful calculus, but so important for us to think about. I don't want him to be here because of me, you know, because of my selfishness of just having him around and that overall loneliness of not having my work buddy. Because the only time I'm not with my dog at this point is when I go to the gym. After Bobby had that light seizure around his 18th birthday, Gabby knew it was time to make some decisions. So she called a service similar to Dr. Ellen's, but in her hometown of Tampa. And this seems so obvious when I say it out loud. But asking for help from experts and folks who've been through what you're going through is a very good idea. They can help you figure out where you are in the process, help you get resources, and even help you decide when to make the final call. It's important to know that the decision to let go never feels right. Because... Sometimes people want to make the decisions for themselves, right? They want their pet there longer. They don't want to let go. But at that moment, it's, it, it can't be about us. It has to be about your pet and recognizing what's right for them. And we look at the time, right, when, when we make this decision as a window of time. And that window opens when we get a terminal diagnosis or when we start to see that, that end of life decline and that window closes when we get into crisis and now we don't have a choice anymore. We have to make a decision. And for some families, they wait for that crisis because they need that certainty. But I find that it comes at a cost emotionally because what you remember is that crisis. As you heard, 18 year old Bobby was really slowing down giving the signals that maybe it was time. Man, I thought to myself, if I keep, if I continue, 
then this is just going to be for me and my parents, honestly, and my parents as well. And I sat in with them and we had a really deep and thorough conversation of like, what does this look like, guys? Like, do you see what he is right now? Do you guys really want to get him to the edge of the end? Or do you uh-huh, want to see uh-huh. him right now, how he is right now, that he's still capable to walk and he's still this and the other? And, and that's right. they agreed that you're like, you know what? I agree. I was like, okay, so I'm going to ma- make this day. This is the hardest decision I'll ever have to make, but I'm going to make it. And that's what's going to happen. And, and that's it. I was just like, it, and I, I knew a Friday would be a good day because they don't give you, unfortunately, despite the fact that he's my child, they don't give me a bereavement <laughs> for fur babies. That needs to change. I think so too. I chose a Friday so that I can have a weekend. Gabby opted to do the euthanasia at home. She made an appointment. When the vet arrived, she did a medical evaluation of Bobby with the family gathered around. And she kind of she kind of just gave me that head nod of like, yeah, I can see why you're kind of doing this. They do some rituals like they make clay prints out of Bobby's paws. And then it's time. Like we were all like taking our turns and holding him and then she's like, okay. I have to say, are you ready? But I know you're not, but are you ready? (laughs) I was like, okay. So we took a few photos and then that's when um, she's like, let's sit down. And so I sat down on the couch and then I put a blanket on my lap and I laid him there and he was, he was tired already that day. Um, And uh, then she gives him like a sedative just so that he can be groggy and sleepy. Is that like a... um like a pill or a shot she gives him a shot and everyone gave him like a couple more pats a little bit more love and then from there she was like okay now i'm gonna give him this one and this is going to be the last one thankfully she doesn't say this is like now we're gonna euthanize him (laughs) she kind of just uses terms that it is not harsh but it's still you you get the point and then i was just i i I held him at this point kind of closer to my chest and she gave him the last one and I was just petting him and smelling him and loving him and kind of just whispering in his ear um, all the little things that I would normally whisper. And and then that's, you know, he just, he left us. Um, it was, as you can see, it's still super emotional and still super raw for me. But at that moment when it happened, I was just, wow, how much how much at peace he was too. Mm. I didn't have to put him in a car to make him anxious to walk Mm -hmm. into a vet. He was just in my arms and he was just at peace. And then I'm at peace. It was just really awesome. And then she was kind of, she wasn't like, I need to take him now. She gave me still some time. And then my parents and my dad um, and my brother kind of just like put their arms around me. And we all had like a hug with him while I had my, I had him in my arms and, she has a nice little basket with a, a nice pillow. She let me walk him out to her car. She delivered him to the crematorium. It was, it was, again, like our own little funeral, but I can cry loud. I can ugly cry. I can Kim Kardashian cry. I can do all those things. <laughs> 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 and still not feel judged. <laughs> so that was nice. <laughs> We humans have a lot of ceremonies and rituals for and about other humans, but very few around our pets. One of the things we don't think about in pet loss are the rituals that are part of of human loss, right? We have wakes and we have ceremony, Mm -hmm. and we don't think about that with our pet. But I think we should. Think about the things you can do to make meaning. For Gabby and Bobby, It was having family around, but it can be entirely customizable to your family and what you want. And sometimes it's playing music. Um, One of the most beautiful euthanasias I was involved in, uh, another sweet old golden, and it was wintertime, but they had a fireplace in the backyard and the fire was lit and we were sitting around the fire and uh, they were playing a song that the dog had been named after. It was Mona Lisa by uh, Elton John. Yeah, and uh, so I, 
those moments stay with me. They told me afterwards that it really was a beautiful experience for them and for the dog. And, and to be able to provide that, you know, warms my heart. Totally. Yeah. I love that song. Mm -hmm. I thank the Lord. There's people out there like you. I thank the Lord. There's people out there like you. We've talked about the big decision and the actual goodbye. But that's only part of the journey. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Dr. Ellen and Gabby share some great ideas on how to make the last days the best they can be and how to lift your spirits in the days following. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or... What is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast, or find it wherever you listen. This episode is brought to you by Google. The Google Cybersecurity Certificate provides the necessary skills to begin a career in cybersecurity. Visit safety.google forward slash cyber workforce today. At the top of the show, I was at the vet with my wife, Shira, and our dog, Rumi. She's been puking a lot. And our veterinarian wondered, maybe Rumi has what she calls empty stomach vomiting. Really know why it happens. Oh, wow. But if they've had an empty stomach for too long, sometimes that just gives them an upset stomach and they throw up a little bit. She so told us to split up Rumi's that. dinner so that she eats a little bit at like 5 p.m. and then a little bit more before bed. We did that and she hasn't thrown up since. Regardless, she is aging and I know our time with her is limited. Which actually brings me to a piece of advice Gabby received when she was facing Bobby's aging make a bucket list and do things like that they would want or they like or even things that just would bring you joy to do together. I don't drink coffee, but for whatever reason, I do drink tea and I do still go to Starbucks, but for whatever reason, I never got him a pup cup. And so... Wait, what's a pup cup? A pup cup, you go to through the Starbucks and like and you can bring your dog and then they give you a little cup and all it is is whipped cream. What, in the drive through Yeah, in the drive through uh -huh. So we went through, we got a little <laughs> of a pup cup. And if you get someone in the window that's like nice and like likes dogs, it's even more exciting because then they're excited too and you kind of made their day. So, um, and so I, I felt like I, I made their day and I told the people and I was like, he's 18 can you guys believe that and they were like no way and then, like a couple other people came to see him so i kind of made it a thing for him and it was fun you went to the beach too right yeah my dad was able to join him and i and that was the friday that we had everything planned so that day we went to the beach the three of us i took some photos of us i took some photos of him and I know, like, again, you can, he's fragile. He's a bit weak at this point. And I was like, let's put him in the water, Pops. Let's see what he does and see if he, and he put him in the water and he gave me a couple little paddles. And I was like, oh, yes. Oh, you know what you are. And it was so nice. And it was just perfect. We had, I put, I wrapped, wrapped him around the towel and we came, um, Aww. we walked back in and he gave us kisses on the way back in. And it was just, Everything about that little moment was just really wonderful. It mm. really just was. 
Dr. Ellen endorses the bucket list. It'll give us a little control during a sad time. Also, it'll make the end of our pets' lives ring out with love and light, despite the pain we're about to experience. I had one client who was a school teacher, and so she was off during the summers, and she knew her dog was was getting older and that, you know, he might not be with her much longer. And so she spent that entire summer taking him to, you know, two or three pet stores a day. He loved to go to the pet store. So she would go, and they would visit, and they got to know all of the pet store employees, and he loved it. Something else Gabby did before she said goodbye to Bobby, and let me say, this is such a good idea. I'm definitely going to do this with Rumi. She got merch. And emotionally, I was like, oh my gosh, Gabby, how can you take care of yourself? Because this is going to be a blow. How are you going to show up for yourself? I know that gifts are going to be it. So let me send myself little reminders of him. I found some place that did socks with his faces on it. I found some a lady that she does like picture portraits. Um, I did. I found someone else that did portraits through water painting. Um, I found someone else that did a keychain. I did like just so many little gifts and then I would send them to, I just put them in random days. So you ordered all the stuff and it was like a staggered delivery schedule. So it would just come whenever? When I would be home and look at my mail or whatever it was, I would get small surprises of Bobby and they would be like, I was getting small hugs and small kisses from him. And I needed that. I needed that so much. I needed moments of reminding of how the love that we shared was this powerful and these little things are just tokens of him that i can carry for the rest of my life mm. sending yourself sporadic pet merch is incredibly imaginative but it may also not be for you grief is complicated some people really don't like physical tokens or pictures popping up and crashing over you like an unexpected wave. So if you can, think about how you would like to remember your loved one and plan accordingly. And also remember that grieving someone you loved is not silly or shameful. Just because you're grieving a pet doesn't mean you shouldn't still lean on your support systems. Throughout this whole process, it strikes me that you were and are very good at asking for help. It comes with experience of seeing. I have lost a lot. Um, My first loss was one of my grandparents when I was like 13. And I saw what the grownups weren't doing. And it was the asking for help and realizing that if they would have, it would have made things easier. And so I knew in this moment, I was like, ah, let me try to take this on by myself. That would be a really stupid idea. I was depressed already, but I didn't want it to be like one that I couldn't come back from. You just don't leave out the community in your moments of grief because it's just so much. It means so much. You want to close everyone off. You don't want to do it, but allow people to show up for you. Amen. And another really poignant thing, it seems that you've uh, embodied throughout this is the idea that it's just as important to take care of yourself as it is to take care of whomever is dying. Yes, you're right, Zach. Uh, One of my favorite quotes is the one that they tell you in the in the airplane, you gotta put your mask on before you put their mask on. Because if you don't put your mask on, you can't help anyone else. I, I love that. And I always I use that constantly. There's moments that I find myself in the shower, just like curled up in a ball crying for him. And then I'm like, it's okay. I let it, I let it go and I released it and I felt it. And then I step out and I put on his socks and I conquer my day. <laughs> That's amazing. You're an inspiration. Thank you, Zach. Thank you for all these great stories and lessons. I feel like he always brings the best out of me. Even though they're dogs, they let you be you. They get to see every part of you. They get to see the good, the bad, and the indifferent, and they still love you for it. And that's just such a lesson in humanity because it's like, man, if we would all just do that for each other, 
how cool would the world be? You know, like, let's just lead with love and then everything else is figure outable. Let's do that. Once again, Dr. Ellen Laframboise. As overwhelming as it can be to start thinking about losing your pet, you want to make sure your focus is on being with your pet right now, right? And make the most of every day that you have, because it's true that we don't know how many days any of us have. It may just be those simple things, like snuggling and head scratches, but that's what's important in the end. Sorry about that, Can I have a, a tall iced coffee with oat milk and a pup cup? I hope Rumi lives another 10 years. That's it. But if she doesn't, She'll die knowing that her family loved her, actively, every day. She'll know she was treated well, especially that time her dad presented her with a small plastic cup overflowing with whipped cream. Real? Here. You want some? Come here. She'll remember licking it up happily on that late summer sunny day oh, you like that. in the back seat. Oh my gosh, you love that. Oh my god, you finished that in like five seconds. Good girl. Goodness. Do you have a problem that needs solving? Send us a note at howto at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-495-4001. And we might have you on the show. And if you like what you heard today, please give us a rating and review and tell a friend. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Joel Meyer is senior editor. I produced this episode along with the amazing Rosemary Belson. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. Carvel Wallace hosts the show. And I'm Zach Rosen. You can normally find me at The Best Advice Show. That's the name of my other podcast. Available wherever you listen to How To. Thanks for listening. At the end of your first year, Discover Credit Cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned, doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned how to snowboard, also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.